All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here again. We are close to wrapping up our subject area Zooms. We're doing history and geography tonight. We'll do science and math tomorrow. And those are kind of the main core things we'll finish up. And then we'll still do lots of conversation in the Facebook group about electives and all those other subjects, foreign language, fine arts, all those things. Um, but this call is about history and geography. They mesh well together. So we thought we'd talk about that. Um, before we begin our conversation, we want to open in prayer. And one of my favorite saints is St. Anne because she was the mother of Mary. And I actually have a statue of her um, teaching Mary. It's a beautiful statue of Anne with the child Mary looking at a book. So I thought we would ask for Anne to help us this evening and always with our motherhood. So let's begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. With love I come to you, St. Anne. By your virtues and holiness, you merited from God the favor of giving life to her who is the treasure of all graces, the most holy virgin. Receive me, good St. Anne, into the number of your true clients, So, for so I profess myself and wish to remain throughout my entire life. Obtain for me from God the power to imitate those virtues with which you are so plentifully endowed. Help me to know and regret my sins bitterly. Obtain for me the grace of active love for Jesus and Mary and resolution to fulfill the duties of my state of life with faithfulness. Save me from every danger that confronts me in life and help me at the hour of my death. Amen. St. Anne, pray, pray for, for us. Life. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Yay. Well, Mimi, I will just turn things over to you and let you share about what you love, what about history, and what you guys use, and then I'll fill in whatever didn't get there. Well, um, I guess, uh, you know, to begin with, I, I personally really like history. So when I went to go teach, um, my own kids i guess i was doing it without even really realizing it um that i was teaching history a lot of historical fiction and you know um i would love to get the books uh from the library or things like that i mean i always read historical fiction when i was a teenager and you know loved all of that stuff but um when i went looking for what i wanted to do with history wise the only thing that I knew when I started was that there was no way I was going to do different cycles for different kids. Um, I, I, my goal was to put everybody on one cycle so that we could all learn history for my sanity, all on the same kind of docket. Um, it was just really important to me. So I went looking for something with that and many, many, many moons ago, I found Connecting with History, which is uh, Connecting with History is RC history, which is Roman Catholic history. Um, it comes from um, their own publisher. They publish their own um, syllabus. Well, this is, this is the volume that has the baby, basically the syllabus, not the syllabus. What am I trying to find, Jenny? Is You're this saying the lesson syllabus? Plan? That's a syllabus. This is syllabus. This you don't is the have syllabus. the lesson plan. I do not have the lesson plan. Here's another one. This, this is volume three. Right. This is volume one. There's volume two, volume three, and volume four. And what it does is RC history, Roman Catholic history, goes on a four-year cycle. So the first year is creation, which is um, ancients, creations, all the way through to Jesus. Okay. Basically, that's the way that you kind of look at it. It's a little bit before Jesus. And then it goes into, it's a 10, I just looked at it, it's 10, um, 10 units, and it goes to the, to the Romans. Okay, so that entire volume, you're covering creation, Greek, Egyptians, Greeks, Romans. Um, I had seen Story of the World, which is an, another, um, another cyclical history basis, but it's Christian, it's Protestant. Um, and I had, everybody had always told me, you got to be careful. It's great. The first two volumes, but that second volume, you got to be really, really careful. And I was like, Oh, that's not a good thing. But I started initially back then with this idea of story of the world. And what I loved about it was that it was one book and I actually have a bunch of the books, but it's one book 
and it was a story. It was literally a story. And so you'd read the story and then you'd do the, the extras, which were map work, which were projects, which were reading. With that idea, I found RC History. So what RC History, what I love about RC History is that it's living books. So there's a spine and it depends on the level of your child. So I'm gonna show you this so that you guys can see it. So they give you cortex for each of the levels. So you're gonna start with beginner, which is K through third grade, okay? Then you're gonna have grammar, four through six, then logic, seven through nine, and then rhetoric, okay? And so they give you a spine and you're reading that spine all the way through the, the entire um, volume of the book. And each volume takes about a year. Um, and then they give you what they say, basic reading lists for each. And then they give you literature and historical books. Now, when I started, I only had a first grader. <laughs> so I got the books and the spine for the first grader. And we taught to the first grader. And then by the time that we got around, we did volumes one, two, and three. There was no volume four back then. There was no American history. And I did ser the serendipity plans by Elizabeth Foss, um, who did an American history type thing. Um, and then by the time I got back to first to, to this one again, I now had a fifth grader. So now I moved up to the next set of books. What I loved about it is that I already had the set of books for my third grader and now my first kindergartner. Um, and so it's living books, it's a story, and it just continues to do story. And what I love even more about it is that now they've added Jenny, do you have the timeline cards or the lesson plans or anything like that? Because I do not. I haven't purchased those. But I know a lot of people who are just starting really like it. So um, we've used it in a co-op setting and you can use it in a co-op setting. They actually have a license to use it in a co-op setting. Um, but as I've gone more and more over the years, I've realized that a lot of even just the basis of the living books taught my kids a lot more about the people behind the history versus just the history. Um, what I also really love about this is that they put in the saints. So when you go to study the saints or religion or anything like that, you have it in here. And my kids have gotten used to every year, they're gonna get a new crop of saints that they're gonna read about and that they're gonna discover and that their little brothers and sisters are gonna discover and that you know things like that that just kind of go from there. So for me, it has been a wonderful thing. Now, a caveat was that that volume four did not come out until very late. So I'm about to start my fifth rotation of this, this series. I've never used them for American history. And last year when I had this, this year that I'm in right now, when I had got to the American history, I finally bought the volume and I don't like it. <laughs> it's, it's very, it's a lot in the 1700s and 1800s and it doesn't, it only covers until the mid, like literally until the world wars, um, it stops. And I, so I added Story of Civilization from Tam. Um, and for me, the two are just the perfect compliments. Um, I feel like they have just such a richness between the two of them um their stories which is again what i love uh but with the american history it goes all the way up until modern history um even though i do have to say now that i've had my two older girls through it um the modern history the, ho the homeschool curriculum modern history the recorded ones we've never done the live ones are excellent um there's a diff there's a Something to be said about having a professor teach you modern history while it's going on, which is really cool. Um, but so for us, that's what we've used. We've, for the most part, have used um, those two uh, for, for that. Economics, I've used two totally different things for two different people. And government, again, two different things for two different people. 
So right. that's it. Very cool, right? Is that it? Yeah, I think so. I wanted to point out in the, um, in the syllabi, in addition to the book lists and all of the um, leveled books and things, it begins with a section in each unit on discussion, background for the teacher, a timeline of events listed that you can you know, make whatever timeline works for your family. Um, there's activity suggestions and those are broken up by division, by level. So like b beginner and grammar levels, um, you might, I don't know, make a knight's helmet and sword is one in this one. And then you move into, you know, the upper levels and you're, you're writing. Oh, and it has copy work and memory work. Yes. Um, That's what I had forgotten to say too. Yes. Yeah. Writing prompts, memory and copy work. They have some um, literature discussion guides in it now that's included for some of the literature uh, selections. And I think the only other thing I would add about the, this particular program is if, if it appeals to you and you research it and you um, look at the website or you buy a manual or whatever you do, realize you're not going to read every book ever. Oh gosh. Yeah. Ever. <laughs> so the great thing about it is it's lots of choices. You can see what you can get, what's on your bookshelf, what you can get at your library, what's affordable. Um, but there's just, there's such a wealth of selection in most of the units and most of the levels that you're just not going to be able to read everything. It's just, you know, so usually what I do is for each unit, um, we're reading a spine together and I like Mimi have now gone into using, I never liked the spines that were in the volume. I know Mimi likes some of them, but I've never liked hardly any of them. So when story civilization came out, that's my spine. Everybody reads or listens to that. We do some of the core texts that are like mapping and Catholic history stuff and saints. And then I'll pick like a nonfiction and a literature for each grade level. And then out of that, I'll pick one that we're going to read aloud to everybody and the rest they read independently. Um, except for my youngest who it's picture books anyway. So I'm reading that to them. So I, very, I limit it a lot as to what we're reading because, as Mimi said, we cycle through every four years, or five years technically, whatever, and then you get to hear it again from a different level. Um, and I love it because that's the way kids learn is introduce them to something and then a few years later when their brain matures, expand upon that. And then a few years later, expand upon that. Um, and so it works really well. Um, Valerie says stopping a modern American, right? But story of civilization doesn't. Story of civilization goes all the way to the election of Donald Trump. <laughs> what does she mean by we need to start after Reconstruction for fifth grade? Oh well, it yeah. for, for Tennessee, um, if yes. we end up wanting to send him back to yes. public school, yes, um, they just finished in fourth grade. They did American history and they stopped at Reconstruction and they want to. In for fifth grade, they do half the year for modern American history, you know, starting picking up after Reconstruction and going through modern. I don't know that. They actually but I would there. definitely go with Story of Civilization. And then, and then they do, um, and then they do Tennessee history for the second, second half. Yeah. And I'm good on that. I second found half of fifth grade, of they fifth do Tennessee's history. Apparently so. Okay. No, we do, we, we do Florida history in fourth. Well, that's, we did Alabama in fourth and I have my project that I did from when I was in fourth grade that was yep. like, like, it was fancy. I'm like, this is what I did in fourth grade. Kid, your writing is not up to snuff. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we we're so bad. I was we, a fourth grade teacher. My poor, poor, my kids, when they're in fourth grade, it's horrible. Well, mine was for, well, it was, then for, it was for Catholic school, um, but it, both me and my brother did these projects and they were, you know, beautiful. And my mom had us do the covers in wood with, um, I don't, wood soldering or something to do the cover oh. and they're gorgeous. Anyway, and we just re, um, emptied my garage and resorted things and I, it was in my box of stuff from my mother and I was like, oh, this, this is what we're going to work on next year when I homeschool you, kid. Yeah. <laughs> So wow. to talk a little bit more about Story of Civilization, um, Story of Civilization is also a Catholic program. It's new, only in the past four years. It's published by Tan Books, um, and it's a four volume set as well. So it starts with ancient history and then goes through the cycles, and the last one is a US history. And the US history, like I said, starts at the conquest of Mexico and goes all the way to the United States in the new millennium. And Donald Trump's name is in here. We just finished it, that's how I know. 
Um, yeah, too. <laughs> so the things that come with story of civilization, if you, the options that you have, again, like with all of these things, if you are pulling your own curriculum together, you have options, you get to choose. But the options are, um, there's a textbook and it's written like Mimi said, as a story, kind of like story of the world was, um, but it's a cohesive story and it's well-written. Philip Campbell really does a good job appealing to kids. I will say the, the author says it's written for middle school as far as the, the level that he was targeting. So the book itself is designed for like fifth, sixth, seventh grade. Um, but it works great as a read aloud for younger kids, or they also have a fantastic audio um, that I get on Audible and my little boys love listening to it because it's all these adventures. It's not, as, it's not quite dramatized, it's says it is, but it's just music. I mean, it's still reading the book with dramatic music in the back. But um, so you can listen to it, you can have them read it, or you can read it aloud. And then you have the options of purchasing the teacher, teacher manual. Um, the teacher manual has questions for review, um, topics for narration, and instructions for the things that you find in the activity book, which is also optional. Um, the activity book, um, I'm trying to think. It does have like coloring pages, but then it also, the majority of it is cutout crafts, crossword puzzles. It's a little more upper elementary, I think, on the activity book. It's definitely not for middle school. Yeah, it's not middle school and it's not really kinder first friendly because if you're paying for a whole book and all you're getting is one coloring page per chapter. Um, so upper elementary, there is also a test book that is good for middle school if you need them to practice taking that multiple choice test and need to assess if they're comprehending what they're reading. Um, and then there are DVD or live or not, or digital streaming um, mini lectures is the best way to say it. I don't know what they call them, but if it's the video and it is the author, Philip Campbell, giving a review of each chapter. And um, we haven't watched those in a while, actually thinking about, because I don't have a middle schooler, but that's targeted at middle school. And um, although I have friends who say they put it on for their middle schooler and all the younger ones watch, um, but that is a very good review of the chapter. It's presented in a different format. And Mr. Campbell is just fun. He's, he's very entertaining to watch. And so he's, he does a good job. And lastly, um, I did pull out the timeline um, that you really can get like that. a timeline that goes with it, which is fabulous because you can stick this up on your wall and it's got everything, you know, that you're going to learn and um, with pictures and words. And so if you're in that volume, you can stick it up on the wall and the kids have a reference place to look at for that particular volume. Um, so I started out and bought the whole packs because I'm so excited that somebody finally did something that was a spine that I would, I knew I would like. Um, and honestly, all I would buy again, just because I still use RC history really as my primary book or primary program is the textbook and the timeline and the audio. Um, teacher's manual is mostly about the activity book and I decided the activity book didn't fit my kids' ages. I can see that my kids that are coming aren't gonna be great with like cut out and worksheets. They're not that kind of, not great at those things. So I probably wouldn't get that, but some kids really like that. Um, so that's available. Um, what else was I going to say about history? I've picked up um, in different seasons. We've used some of the Seton history books. They're not bad. Um, they're Catholic and they're written mm -hmm. concisely and well. So um, I think that's also a good option if you just need something straightforward and a, just a text. There also is the Catholic history textbook project. Is that, am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And that has um, Catholic textbook project, Catholic textbook project. And that starts, I think, at fifth grade, fourth grade. Fourth. And they have a sequence of actual textbook um, that uh, that's, a you know, Catholic schools use it. And so it's a very methodical, good, solid program. Personally, I know I have friends that use non-Catholic history, but I'm not confident enough or maybe patient enough to weed out the slant. Um, and especially like Mimi said, we actually started with Story of the World too, but we're told when you get to Reformation, it's a disaster for Catholics because it's told from the Protestant point of view. Um, so I just was like, I'm gonna play it safe. I'm gonna stick with Catholic resources that I know are approved. Um, RC history, 
this is the, I guess, specifying. RC History is the name of the company. Connecting with History is the name of the program. It confuses people sometimes. But um, I like that they pre-screen all the books because I don't have time to read everything. And I can hand a book to my high schooler knowing that there's not anything anti-Catholic in it. Um, I can't read everything. Does Story of Civilization have stuff for my little ones? That's what you like about RC. If, you know, listening to the audio is probably totally enough for a kinder first, second, even third grader. It's, you, it introduces them. Does she have, do you have, Valerie, do you have a, um, an activity kid? And first. That first grader. Is I that have, first grader a, a I, I, partner, okay. Um, who is nonverbal and delayed. Oh. Then the you can totally do story of civilization and target it to that fifth grader. Yeah. And then, and have the audio, the fun things. I would even, that fifth grader, probably the activity book is literally for that grade. Like that is what it is. And it does have the occasional coloring page or the map that's really right. simple. And your kindergartner could totally do that. Um, now, if you wanted, you're, you're gonna do US history. Um, I can, help, I can help you and I can even give you a, some really good picture books if you wanna like just add to that because yeah, I wouldn't I, even I, tell I, you. And I could, I can pick up her picture book for Rose. Like this is probably the era that I could get good picture books because I can get one for Rosa Parks. I can get exactly, one on. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. So exactly. if you go, if you join the Facebook group for St Tan Story of Civilization and I can put the link up, um, they have in the file section books, literature books, picture books, read aloud books that go along with each chapter of Story of Civilization. And the gal just posted um, a fantastic file like this week or last week that has all volume four stuff. And it's wonderful. It's like pulls out all different resources that you can use and is there for free. So there's that like kind of book list stuff that you can grab. That group's fantastic. I highly recommend it if you're going to go Story of Civilization route because uh, the author's in the group. So you can actually ask questions of him and then there's such a wealth of moms who have figured out how to make it work for all ages and it's good so I'll make sure we get that link up there um, the other thing I would say is that history is one of those things that you really don't have to teach in any formal way at all until fourth fifth grade if you're homeschooling long term um, in the earlier grades it's more about I, you know, I mean, I hate to say social studies because it's just that term bugs me, but it's more about knowing where their place is in the world. So like, I love going with my kindergartners and we draw a picture of our house and then we draw a circle around it and we write the name of our city and then we draw a circle around it and we draw, or not circle, we draw the shape of Texas because we're from Texas and draw our state and then the United States and they start to see where they are as a part of the world. And those kinds of things that are just very basic, but help them understand. And then we read all the good books about George Washington and whatever else comes our way. Um, so I think that that's something that can be very, very, very flexible in the younger years. You don't have to have a program. If I was starting with my first, um, I probably would start connecting with history like not till second grade. I don't even think I would do it kinder or first. You can, it's designed to, but I just wouldn't head that way. And story of civilization again, I would just get the audio until they're like fourth grade and then I would, you know, add stuff to it. The audio is really fun. Um, other thoughts about history? What else have I seen? Are there any programs that you guys have seen that you've used or thought about using that you have questions about? Okay. Okay. Um, I say? Well, Scola Rosa I used for a couple of years, but at, you know, different levels. And um, I think they use a lot of, like, living books, you might want to call it. Just read from books, but they do cycles. Right. You know, just selections for each cycle. Cycles are really helpful when you have multiple kids. I mean, mm -hmm. even if you just, you know, even if you just have two kids, if you're going to be in this for a while, it's helpful to... Um, like Mimi said, to, it's just easier on mom's brain. I mean, you're going to have to teach, like, if you have four kids, you're going to have to teach four different levels of math, but you don't have to teach four different time periods of history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you can simplify things for yourself by 
kind of going that cyclical route. And I think a lot of homeschoolers really, you know, embrace that. Well, Jenny, you and I were talking about this this morning and I had never really thought about it for history. I always kind of think of it for science, but that you can build backwards for history. So that let's say that you want to be in American history in, you know, fourth grade. Okay, well then how do we do it this way? Or maybe that's the year you don't want to be doing American history because you want to be doing the state during that year. And so you want to be doing a different history with a state geography. You can always build backwards. Um, what becomes essential is to know that in high school, they have to have certain histories. So, you know, you don't think about that until you get to a little bit older, but like if they are in fifth grade and they want to be going into, okay, so where do I put them in? That happens a lot with people that pull their kids out because a lot of times when people pull their kids out, but you can always work backwards with history and say, look, I want the year that there's an election, I want to be on American history because I want to cover that. Or I don't want to be on American history because I don't want to cover that. Or, you know, mm -hmm. um, you can build backwards with that or say, look, for us, it just was a totally and completely by accident that we finished American history with my eighth grader. And my, when he becomes ninth grade, he'll start in ancients. But now I have a seventh grader that will be in ancients in seventh grade. So then by the time he finishes the cycle in 11th grade, at least then he can go straight into government or economics. Um, so it does, history does work itself out to look at it and say, okay, if I want to have a four year, you know, if you have modern mobilists, they do American history and world history and British history all at the same time. So it just depends on how much history you would like to do. Um, Mimi did many hours of history when her children were little. My oldest daughter wanted to be a history major. Um, so like, it just depends on how many how much you want to do it, but you can backtrack it and you can change it. Um, you know, sometimes, like you said, if we only covered to reconstruction one year, I'm not going to go on to back to ancients without covering the rest of the, of the year for math, for, um, for American history. So maybe I'll start with American history and then bypass. So I, I, I do think that there's some flexibility with that. And I forget why, but we did Volume one, volume two, and then we did just this year did U.S. history, and next year we're going to do volume three. I don't remember why I did that, but that's what I decided to do, and it's just going to be that way. I think it's is it. Do you remember why it I decided it's, that? It's the live classes for age, for homeschool. Probably it probably because the homeschool connection classes are two years ahead of where we are and two years behind. So yeah, I it was something like the that. live classes mm -hmm. are killing me, um, but they're in medieval. And I'm in ancients, right? So I need to do the recorded. So maybe that's what you did to get them I don't into. Know, I didn't do it, but I didn't join it. But anyway, I yeah. So there's lots. There is flexibility. And the other point I wanted to make about backtracking and figuring out is like, at least in my knowledge of talking to parents today who have kids in public high schools, which is limited, they don't do a cycle or a specific like they do history but it's like world history in one year and American history in one year mm -hmm. um, it's very very condensed I guess history I um, there's some charter schools and things that'll do ancients and then modern or whatever medieval but um, for the most part it's it's not as pretty as everyone you know mm -hmm. thinks it would be um, so your kids have some flexibility and it's not like panic when your kids in kindergarten that they need to follow the public school plan. Um, you mentioned that we do have to decide, you know, world history, American history, and we probably should teach state history, um, depending on what state you are in, it may or may not be required. Um, but that's a fun thing to teach. And I'm going to, there's going to be a thread on um, which state, uh, what state resources do you use to teach your state's program? Because each state that I've lived in seems to have a few programs that work that most people pretty much use. I know in Texas, we use something called Discover Texas, which is all online and really cool, but um, lots of different options. So we'll put that up there because it's just so different state to state of what you, you know, what resources you can find. Um, but, you know, that is one of those, those, those requirements that even families who follow a set homeschool program or buy enroll in a program or do a full curriculum, 
they still have to figure out their state, you know, plan. That's mm -hmm. not handed to them. Like Seton doesn't have something for every state of the United States, I don't think. Um, so that's something you, you decide when to throw in and you decide how to do it. Um, a semester, like Valerie said, that the school's doing is it not a bad idea to kind of put it all there. Um, you could spread it out over a year. You can dabble in it every year. Um, so that's something to consider. And then also we said, um, talking about geography. And I know the most logical way is to incorporate geography in with your history and try to kind of complement it. But there's also kind of another level of, of geography that's physical geography and um, more specific than you can really get with, you know, ancient geography is something that only a higher level kids are really going to understand how the different country boundaries shifted and so forth. Um, so what, what things from elementary to middle to high school have worked for you as Mimi as far as geography stuff? So, um, I spent, I would say, kinder, first, second, and third. Your audio is a little low. There you go. Are we better? Better. Sorry, I've got some headphone mm -hmm. issues going on. Um, I would say until about fourth grade, before the state history stuff, very much talking about things like landforms, physical geography, uh, exactly like what you were saying, the street that we live on, the city that we live on, you know, what is a map? What is a key? What is, you know, things like that. Um, flags, oh my goodness, my children and flags, oh my gosh, we did flags for years. They were obsessed. They still listen to podcasts about flag. They're such homeschoolers. <laughs> um, so like flags, things that were very concrete to put their geography and like we were saying, social studies. Um, and I really, I use the Madara Mobilis, um, kind of the guide of like by, um, by continent. So we have one year where, and it's usually third grade, second or third grade, because it's already past the time that we've talked about the streets and all that stuff where I spend one kind of month on each um, continent. So we'll go, you know, and then we'll have the, all the living books and we'll have the maps and we'll have the animals and the flags and all that stuff. Um, but that is an excellent way to do a year of history. That would be a great way to do social studies, especially if you have littles like Nikki for you, like you have littles, like that's the perfect thing to do. Um, to study geography without making it geography, you know. Um, but so for when they're small, that's what we do. We do okay. a lot of living books, a lot of maps, flags. Um, inevitably, you'll have a child that falls in love with one country and that's all they want to study. I have four boxes of information about Australia. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what happened. Oh, I do know what happened. It was the Sydney Olympics. Yeah. So we did Australia for a very long time. Um, so, you know, you'll, sometimes you'll get something like that. Um, around fourth grade, we do Florida State History. So that's when it starts to really, geography starts to take a different turn. Um, that's also when history starts to kind of, that's when I start to really do the mapping of what we're studying in history. And so we, it just takes a natural turn from our, whatever history we're studying, we start to do maps and that's what it is. Um, and then in high school, I use two resources and they do it all the years of high school. So ninth grade, they do a little bit, 10th grade, they do a little bit. If they're done by 10th grade, grade, they're done. If not, they go into 11th grade and they use two resources. And Jenny and I use the exact same resources. Memoria Press Geography. It is by far, the best out there um, too. Um, I, my daughter who did, who did a lot of geography, one. just, she just liked geography. My oldest one did not do one and two. She went straight into volume three. Volume three is a overview of the other two volumes. Um, but she was really good at geography. She didn't need it. My, my other kids have gone through one and two. Um, and then when they finished that, they do a coloring book and i know it sounds crazy but this is called it's called the world geography coloring book and this world geography coloring book 
is about this thick and it has all the countries and then all the countries are it's by continent then they're subdivided by countries then they go into the the a lot of the agriculture and what's going on economic wise and what's going on with um a lot of the landforms which when you get to high school all of the landforms that you've been talking about now you need to like identify them and what is geography and, and beyond that that book and then at the end of all the flags because <laughs> we're back to flags um but they do have like this political portion at the end that we don't do because it's political um you know what what are the all the different politics behind it we don't do that but that book you have to have 72 colors to color that coloring book and that is like their crowning achievement when they finish geography um and i don't have it because i actually packed up my daughters because she went all summer last summer coloring it because she was like i am not going into junior year with my coloring book i'm gonna finish it before <laughs> and so she colored it and she finished it um my ninth grade my rising ninth grader francisco has already had me order the book so it's on its way um but he's like i'm getting ahead i'm doing it in the summer <laughs> i'm learning from my kids it is a very thick book um but what i love about it is that more than anything because i feel like the geography book from memoria press really covers well about the politics behind the, the relationships between the different governments um yeah and you'll see mm -hmm. Like they'll talk about why it is that this this is affected by this, you know, why map. is South Korea, North Korea, and so they still have the maps of it, but mm -hmm. it's much more corollary. And then they have to label the maps in the other book, in the workbook. They have to in write the workbook, it out, which and is the label. Not an easy thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, what it's great about it is that if they've already done that, when they go to do the coloring book those relationships are just further cemented and you're starting to color and they, they, they do it. So um, even if you don't have a coloring kid, even if you have, especially, especially if you don't have a coloring kid, um, the, the idea of, you know, you follow the instructions at the beginning and they tell you choose 37 colors for this map. And you're like 37 colors. Yeah. 37 colors. Um, but hands down, every person that I've spoken to, that has ever considered geography a priority because that's the other conversation to have. There are some parents that choose to say, you know what, they're gonna just get it eventually and I'm not gonna spend that much time. Oh, I don't know what grade level, Marianne. What do you think? So technically, I think they say seventh or eighth is when you start them. I'll look it up. Okay. Um, Marianne, it might be something that you could do together, mm -hmm. like both of your kids together right um and get a lot more out of it if you're mm -hmm. doing it together discussion wise too what does it say grades four and up it's not a fourth grade book geography so one to your children mm -hmm. <laughs> really okay well, that's good to know <laughs> so middle school if they're motivated but the geography three set says seventh grade and up okay yeah i i wouldn't start before age 12. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would wait. It's too abstract. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, very abstract. We, but anyway, we, so th that's if you want to do like you want to do geography yeah. and you mm -hmm. want to do both of them. And if you don't, don't do the geography. Don't do the coloring book. Just do the three, you know, things, or just do the one, all encompassing geography class. But for my, my seventeen-year-old who is doesn't know whether or not she wants to go to college or not. Um, she knows she's going to go into a gap year. She doesn't know if she has a vocation. She doesn't know what she's going to do. Um, it was a very nice half credit. Yeah. <laughs> a very nice half credit. <laughs> class. Yeah. So. Well, and in the state of Texas, we are tech. I mean, homeschoolers are not bound by these rules, but to graduate in Texas in high school, you have to have a half credit of geography. Oh, so know that. it's kind of a bizarre thing because Texas, but um, we have to but, have health. But my kids do it every year so that it just adds together in high school. But um, you made me think of something else to say about geography. Oh, well, I can start backwards at mine. Okay, so let me, did you have anything else, Mimi? I didn't mean to cut you off. Okay, so again, we do, 
um, kind of fun map things when they're younger and start. Um, we love listening to, did I bring? Um, things like geography songs and um, this one is, the one I picked up is just sing around the world, but we have a states and capitals one that my first grader loves listening to and he can name most of the capitals now just because he sings the song, which is way better than my mm. junior in high school who, who's like trying to learn it now <laughs> again because she's tried. Um, she's not a good memorizer, never has been. But um, so songs, just things to get, we, we have a globe. We just point at when we're reading a story, if it's like our read aloud or it's like our main, not like every single book we pick up, but we go to the map. Where did this happen in the world? Especially if it's not in the United States. Um, I have a big US map on the wall. I have a big world map, but it's just not up on the wall since we have the globe. It was in a different house. So just those kinds of things and making them aware that we live in this world. Um, like Mimi said, focusing on physical geography, I um, sometimes in early years, if I feel like they need the landforms and stuff, I use a child's geography. It's the Ann Voskamp book. Um, it's pretty Protestant, but because I read it aloud, I can kind of skip some of the excessive. I, they're just, they love Jesus so much and they love God and it's awesome. But it gets like every paragraph talking about that. I'm like, okay, wait, talk, me, talk to me about what a bay is and about, anyway. So child's geography, I, I sometimes use, not with every kid. Um, and then else landforms wise in the early grades. I think that's kind of what I've done. I've done um, the Modern Mobile uh, has a couple books that are recommended that are on landforms and things like that. Um, what I really love doing in second grade is the Catholic Heritage Curricula Explore the Continents. And it's a packet. And like Mimi said, you go each month to a different continent. And it's worked really well for my kids who aren't going to like write a whole bunch because it's just cut and paste. So we get a poster board and we do a rough outline of a continent and they color it based on where there's like mountains or you know, not like very detailed, very rough. Mm -hmm. And then the packet from CHC has animals that live in that country and they can pick, I always tell them to pick two or three to glue on there. And then it has landmarks from that country. And then it has saints from that country because it's Catholic. And they paste a few of those on there. And we talk about whatever it is they pick. I don't talk about, they have like a page of like a dozen landmarks. So I don't teach them all of them. I just, we pick two or three. Um, so I love that program because it's done for me and I don't have to kind of, you know, collect. But it does have recommendations for books you can read that are based in that continent and things like that to make it, you know, um, richer. Um, so I will use that often in second grade. Their third grade packet is um, countries and they've, it's almost the same thing, but you don't draw a map. You make a little um, passport book, like a travel brochure. That required more writing, and that was hard for my third graders, but it's the same principle. You pick like a, a main, a big country or a significant country every month or every, two every month, and you kind of go through and just study mm -hmm. that particular country. Um, that one's okay. Um, I also dabble in, I couldn't find my um, world geography one, but if you want multi-age where you have a bunch of kids doing the same type of geography lessons, the trail guide for U.S. geography and the trail guide for world geography are really good for that kind of learning. Because, um, so this is, um, it's hard to explain, but like there's these, there's questions that you discuss that you want them to learn about the geography. And there's these little footprints that tell you what age level it's designed for. And there are these like activities that you can do and it shows you what age level it's designed for. Um, so I think this is, on the, we didn't use it this year, so I'm gonna refresh my memory. Another tip, this is just a random tip for people who make your own curriculum. Write in the inside cover what grade levels the book is preferred for, because most of these don't say, except you have to look on the website, like the geography from Memorial Press, you have to look it up. And after skipping it for two years, you'll forget. Um, Okay, so primary is grades three to five, intermediate is five to eight, and secondary is eight to high school. I've never used it in high school. I think it's not, it would take a lot of adding to, but from like that third grade to, to sixth or seventh grade, I think it's a really nice like little thing you can do every day. We do it in our morning basket um, to help them learn. And again, it's the flexibility that you can learn as much or as little as you want. 
And this one on US history has the mapping. Um, I do mapping for the US um, in, I just give them a, I mean, starting in like, well, Peter's third, so third or fourth grade, I hand them a blank US map. They label as many as they can. And then a month later we do it again. And we just kind of do it very casually on map work in that way. Um, but then another thing I love to use this, I wrote grades, see, I wrote it on this one. I wrote grades three to seven. Um, this is a manual from um, Beautiful Feet Press, Beautiful Feet Books. Um, they use living books, a literature approach to teach various things. And this particular, um, it's a unit study basically, but this one could go all year long. Um, but it teaches, this one says geography, history, and science. I focus in on the geography. Um, but it uses these old hauling sea hauling books. There's Paddle to the Sea, Men of the Mississippi, uh, Tree in the Trail, and uh, Seabird. And the cool thing about these is, again, it's a story, and it, so it's really engaging. But um, this, I'm trying to think of an example. So Paddle to the Sea is about an Indian in a canoe. Um, and he has a little wooden figure that he puts in a toy canoe and you follow the journey from, I have to remember where it's from, from Canada overland into the Atlantic Ocean. And then like Men of the Mississippi is a turtle that goes down the Mississippi River. So fun. He's an alligator snapping turtle, I think. Um, but so he's hatched and he goes through America to the Gulf of Mexico and you follow that. Um, tree in the Trail is a tree, the cut, this cottonwood tree, that watches the Santa Fe Trail and kind of all the history out and geography out there. And then Seabird, oh good, it's on the back. <laughs> no, Seabird is a gull um, and he's on a sh ship or out and talks about shipping. Um, is it all shipping or is there other stuff in here? I think he comes into port at some, they come into port at some time and he watches the ship, but so more about on the water and what happens there. And I feel like that's a really nice thing um, to do. So you did all this on top of history. Um, yes, in like third or fourth grade onward, I will generally do history and geography both. Um, I might sometimes block schedule it. So we might decide to do, we're doing history all year round, but then we'll just do like a geography unit in the fall and then we'll do, I don't know, something completely different in the spring, like music or something random. Um, Mimi, what about you? Geography. Well, I was going to say the hauling books. Um, I would say that there is a very marked reading comprehension level difference between those four books. Um, we fun story. We always do paddle to the sea as a first grade narration after Aesop's fables. Um, I started it with Luisa and we just finished Ignacio's. But I don't, I don't, My I first record grader that. could not narrate that. Your first grader couldn't narrate, narrate, narrate Paddle to the Sea? Just one chapter? Maybe. Yes, he could. Yes, he could. But Michael a lot could of totally scientific, do it. scientific language, though. It's still not, anyway. No, Paddle to the Sea. Well, we, that, when we go from Aesop's Fables, which are very, very little, we go to Paddle to the Sea, and I yeah, start at the beginning, it's 28 chapters, and at the beginning, I start, like, paragraph by paragraph. And then I get up and I get up and I get up. It's a really engaging story. So yeah, they it like it. And then I do the maps and all that stuff. But fun fact, when I started with Luisa, I started, I couldn't, I had too many babies. So I would record her narration. Mm -hmm. So I have recorded narrations Aww. for Paddle to the Sea for all five of my kids. Aww, and it awesome. is so special because it's Paddle to the Sea. And it's funny because when... We started Paddle to the Sea, I bring it out, and this happens all the time with Ignacio, poor Ignacio. It's like the kids come running, oh, he gets to do that book this year. Um, but it's a great, but the reason I'm saying that is because my, it just finished eighth grade, just did written narration of Men of the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I don't do them in the same year. Right. I'll do like one one so year, why, one the next year, one the next year. So, exactly. And also, you're... So the trail, the trail grows great with American history. It does. So like the trail guide, 
this stuff, it takes me maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15. Yes, exactly. And I'm only doing it like once or twice a week. And then history, I'm doing, it's going to take me 15, like I, nothing in my house takes longer than 15 or 20 minutes unless it's at above like fourth grade. So we're doing all these little things. Um, and so it, it doesn't, we do do a lot of little separate things because that's our attention span at that age level. I can't do long things. I can't make them sit that long. So we do a lot of little things. Um, the trail guide takes like five minutes max. So I might just throw that in or we listen to us, you know, the songs um, on top of the history. So now history might take me longer on the days that we do history. We don't do it every day, but if we do history three times a week, it might take me 45 minutes, but that's because we're doing like three different things related to history. I'm reading something aloud. They're reading something about themselves. They're narrating something or whatever. Um, and then in middle school, they're doing some of it on their own. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to send them off to read a chapter of men and then come narrate to me or, or fill in a map. Um, so for that, it's not requiring me as much anymore. And then after we do that, we do move into the Memoria Press stuff um, and do, so I think I've done eighth, ninth, and 10th grade has been what we've done for the geography, for the Memoria Press um, each year, because it's one, two, three. That's just what fit for my kids. Um, and then I also wanted to throw in for upper levels, Homeschool Connections now has some geography classes. They're doing, either they just did or they're about to do a live middle school geography class for the first time. Um, and it's taught by Dan Egan, who's fantastic. So that's going to be great. And they have a recorded one that is more about physical geography for high school. And it's a one semester course taught by Philip Campbell, who wrote the story of civilization, but he's, he's a fantastic teacher. So I had my daughter who's an 11th grader go back and do his physical geography. Cause when we did the Memoria Press, we kind of we kind of let go of all the physical geography stuff. And I felt like she needed a little reminder on weather and things like that. You know, and I was going to say too, um, I don't know if you guys have ever used teacher pay, teachers pay teachers. Um, you don't know what that is. Teachers pay teachers is a, an online forum for teachers to be able to share the things that they create for their classrooms and make some money back on it and whatever. They have some excellent, excellent things on landforms uh three-part cards and um bingo and like you know would be an awesome thing to play with a few times a week um as part of a morning basket or things like that um that would just be something that's fun for that uh so just to put that out there I used to use Kerclick, which was a, another type of um, thing like that. And I, so I have a lot of resources that when it comes to um, just random geography things that I would want to do. Um, but there's a lot of, because it's an added thing to the history in most programs in public schools and in, in charter schools and Catholic schools, a lot of teachers develop their own, like, what they want in a classroom and can't find. And so Teachers Pay Teachers has a wealth of information that has to do with geography. And a lot of it is very grade specific. So it works very well for if you want something that's done in the background, or if you want just an extra activity for, um, let's say I, I want something, I need something independent that my kid can do yeah. while Probably. I'm teaching this. A geography something like this a three-part card or you know um, a copy work or something like that for for geography that is perfect for under third grade so yeah. teachers pay teachers a little spiel in there I don't have anything in there but I have spent quite a bit of money on it we also um, dabbled in the memoria press states and capitals book if you're doing a US history thing and you want to review states and capitals um, it's built very similar to the upper level geography stuff that it's pretty much, um, it has supplemental books that tell you about the states and then like one page per state kind of thing. And then a map that you um, can color and write, like the kid just writes the abbreviation and the capital and the nickname of the state. And then, you know, they can color in the map and then you just kind of read a little bit about the state. So that was a good introduction that, but was, just, I needed something systematic um, that I would make sure I did because I tend to, states and capitals, it's 
I said, are one of those things I'm like, mm. <laughs> so, but yeah, um, what else can we say about history and geography or what questions do you have? I wanted to add that Mimi and I were talking earlier today and when you have all these resources and you find all the stuff that you love, 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 and then you need to translate that into what does that look like in a week? We're going to talk, we're going to, we're planning some talks on that because that is tricky to say, well, when do I do what has, you know, which, which day and what order and how much do I do each day or each right. week? That's something we're going to definitely talk about because that can be tricky. What other what questions do you guys have? These are good questions. Well, it's just a general question. I still haven't figured out how, you know, figure out time because I have one son who is, you know, learning disabilities and the other one is very bright. And so I have never been able to get it together. So hopefully if I stay around, I'll figure it out. But what, what particularly, I mean, that's really tough because you have mm -hmm. the two ends of the spectrum, but what, like, is there something that is like particular to trying to figure out what's best for them? Mm -hmm. Like, are, are you, are you good with figuring out their learning style, like the way that they can learn and you can teach them? Um, I don't think I've really figured it out because I've tried too many different things. But one thing I do know is that the younger son who is very bright has suffered from early on from lack of attention. because I've just let him go. Mm -hmm. The other guy needs like a lot of help. And um, I just think I may have to be revamp everything for this coming year. An idea so. that comes to mind, and mm -hmm. this is so simple, so it may not even help in a mm -hmm. significant way, but um, moms that have kids that are all kind of different levels, different ages, mm -hmm. sometimes will alternate which kid they start the day with um, so that they each get they may not get the same amount of time because they don't need the same amount of help. Mm -hmm. But the, if you sometimes make sure you give that attention to the one kid, at least half the time first, mm -hmm. it kind of boosts their, okay. it seems more equitable, I guess. And it boosts mm -hmm. their confidence. And so, okay. you know, like moms with many, they might say, well, on Monday I start with Sue, <laughs> Susie and Tuesday I start with John and okay. Wednesday I start with, you know, um, with someone else and so something small like that maybe even mm -hmm. would ha make him feel like okay yeah i do get half of her okay yeah i never thought of that except i did today i said well i think i'll start with him tomorrow because i really didn't get anywhere today with him and it was the first time i've ever thought of that because i always want to get the hard one out of the way yes because yes. <laughs> yes. we might I not get to everything you know and I can't compare that because the kids that I currently uh, actively teach are younger, but like mm -hmm. I am sitting at a table and they have their work and I'm going back and forth and we take turns. So I do one thing with this kid and then I do one thing with this kid and I do one thing with this kid. And the older kid finishes first because he has more stuff he can do independently, but I'm still giving them that back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, they, once, once we get through them, the days we do morning basket, once we get through the all together stuff and their kind of table work is spread out, they get to pick what order they do it in. And so, you know, that makes it easy for me to go back and forth and the short lessons help with that mm -hmm. too. So they both feel like I'm sharing. And then when the one has finished their work with me, I send them off to go do the rest of their work mm -hmm. without me. So I can focus on the hard stuff with the, yeah. the other one. Yeah kind of is entertaining to my husband now that he's home. He's like, how do you sit there and do that and switch back and forth <laughs> all the time? I'm like, if I don't, it's chaos. Like they can't. <laughs> so yeah, I have fond memories of sitting on the floor in our schoolroom in our old, our previous house. And I had like a toddler on one side and we were doing a puzzle. And then I was doing a dictation lesson with an older kid. So I had the book and then the one on the right was doing math and I kept leaning over to help and fix. So I was like, <laughs> And that's just how it goes, yeah. you know, but it works. <laughs> well, and sometimes the older, the, the one that needs, that needs the attention for the academics, mm -hmm. 
um, the perception from the one that needs the attention because they need the attention psychologically. Right. <laughs> the perception is that the time is never there because then we're in a, we're in, we're, we're in, a, in a land of absolutes, you know, especially at that age. Not at oh, that age. Lord. Um, I know I have a 12 and 15 year old myself, so, you know, um, but the, the other, another way that you could do it is I don't know if they each know, um, timing wise, how that is going, but something just as simple as giving them a heads up and saying, we're going to work on this for this subject. And then I'm going to get to you for this and sticking by mm -hmm. that and saying, I'm going to work on with, you know, Johnny with math for the next 40 minutes and then you're next. And then I'm going to work with you. What would you like to work with me today? Because he doesn't need you to mm -hmm. work with him, you know, whatever, but right. what subject would you like me to work with you today? Okay. And then do that. And it might be less physical time, but it might be mm -hmm. just pointed it out mm -hmm. that you're available for him to work right. with him and then work with him. And it might be just as simple as just sitting there while he's working on that and saying, I'm here, I'm supporting you, whatever. And then putting a time and saying, we're going to do 20 minutes or whatever, however many minutes. And then being very diligent with your time with him and making sure that you're not going back to the one that needs the attention Okay. And teaching that one to be patient when you're with the other one. Okay. Um, it happens a lot when you have two of two girls or two boys. When it comes to that, um, I've ha I have two girls and then a space and then two boys. <laughs> um, but my friends that have other ones, they have different strengths and weaknesses. So, so it doesn't have that conflict doesn't happen, but Everybody needs to learn that there are turns and that everybody's turn is important. And even though one child might need, and I'm, I'm speaking from somebody who has two severe learning issues and three totally normal kids. <laughs> um, even though realistically, I need to spend more time on phonics with her because she needs more time on phonics, when I'm with you working on math, your time is just as important mm -hmm. as hers is with phonics. Yeah. So I need to teach her not to interrupt this time and him not to interrupt this time. And that is probably the hardest thing you are ever going to teach your kids <laughs> when it comes to school wise, uh -huh. because they see you're their teacher. So mm -hmm. especially if they've never been in school, they don't realize that. And so, but it's really important that we teach them that when you're with another child, just like you want mom to be with you, it's important that you respect the other person's time as well. And it is really hard to not drop everything to help the dyslexic right. while they're reading or to not, they're struggling. And so you want to go to them and you want to struggle. So you need to create, just create a script for yourself. Just mm -hmm. say, find something that you can say that will calm your body down and will, will be able to say, I value what you're doing. If you cannot do that by yourself, I need you to close the book and find something you can do by yourself until I'm done with your brother. That's what I was going to say is mm -hmm. one of the things, I don't have kids with, I have one kid with special needs, but he kind of blends in with right now. But um, we, I does not, like knowing these things, knowing that each kid really does need some of my time and attention, I pick materials each year that they're going to have to do with me even as a junior in high school, they're going to have to come to me and we're going to sit down and we're going to do this because I want them to know that their education is still important, even though they can do it without me. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll pick resources that and I'll just make sure I have one thing every time that's a discussion or that's 
a, you know, like a dictation or a quiz or something where we have to do it together. And on the flip side, I make sure that every kid, even the kid who struggles the most, has something they can do independently. That if they can't do anything else, they can do something while I'm working with the other kids. Um, and so I'll even pull out stuff that I'm like, yeah, we don't really Copy work. need to do this. Handwriting. Copy work, handwriting. I mean, middle school, it would be, for me, it would be more like a vocabulary book or something very basic that they just copy, you know, words or whatever, something that they could do without any help, um, even if I wouldn't otherwise do it, just because I need that balance. I need mm -hmm. stuff they do with mom, stuff they do by themselves um, for all levels at all ages. Except and that works, for the, right, that works for the two ends of the spectrum. Because if you have a very gifted child, Valerie, I think you said you have, you're, old, you're fifth grader, right? So if you have a very gifted child, that child wants to fly through his work and he wants your attention now. He doesn't want you to be with the other kids. We are teaching virtue as well as we're teaching school. And so it works for both ends of the spectrum. That gifted child also needs to learn that mom has some sort of um, knowledge to give and the discussion needs to happen and the narration needs to happen. And that when I am working with X, Y, and Z, I need to be working with X, Y, and Z. So it's like the two ends of the spectrum. It's just, we're teaching virtue. We are teaching patience. We're teaching all of these things. And in the end, preparing for that, like making sure that you're prepared for that. Like what Jenny says, like making sure you have independent work and work that's with mom. Like I was just, Jenny and I just had this conversation because earlier we were talking about just my own personal planning. And I have, I now have a first grader that I'm going back to what my first first kids were when I didn't have two minutes to put together um, because he's very independent. And I've never had one that is as extremely independent as he is. And he gets very frustrated when mom is not there. And I have three children that are in upper grades that when they have something that I need to work with them, I need to work with them. I cannot yeah. stop a 55 minute time thing. So yeah. I need to have both things that are independent. I was telling I'm going to put some symbols on my thing so that he can do all the independent work that he needs to and then he can go play outside until mom's ready for him right I, that's what i was gonna say too i was like i was gonna say that they, they i don't i try not to make it like a bunch of busy work that i said that they don't necessarily need i make sure they have some independent work to gain that confidence to gain that skill of doing independent work but it's not like dumb work or wasteful work or total busy work i'm not giving them dot to dots necessarily unless it's with math but I'll tell them you can take a break, you know? Okay, I, you go take a break, go outside, go to your room, and when I'm done, I'll come get you. And that's harder sometimes to pull them back from that break, which is why I have that independent work and try to plan it so that they have something to do. But they can, you know, they can learn to wait. Mm -hmm. And that's- really or, you or you can peg it around some, another natural break. So it might be the type of thing where you might wanna work with your 12 year old and say, I'm, we're gonna work with you after lunch. Um, so that it's a natural break mm -hmm. where you peg it for that. And then you just say, okay, this is a natural break. And you know, the other kid gets an hour or like, I remember Christy, Jenny would wanted to finish the book. So he wants, she wanted to read. Okay, fine. Then just read, just be quiet and let me work with the other kids and you read. And that's a very valid, you know, it's the never ending conversation of, can we please stop reading so I can homeschool you? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> I think I homeschooled just so that I didn't have to say those lines. Um, but, you know, it's a very valid and hard concern mm -hmm. that takes lots of time, lots of practice, and lots of patience. And that's why I said the thing about the script. You know, find the words that are going to calm you down and are going to calm them down. Because the last thing you want is a person at your thing going, I need your mom, 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 mom. Yeah. I have a dear friend who used post she uses post she uses post notes for everything. But she she every kid has their own color post-it note. And then when they need something, she had them write what they needed on the post-it note, and then she would they would put it next to her. And then they would walk away. 
she said, because it got to the point where I was like, I can't do this right now. So yeah. find what works for you, mm -hmm. but something has to work for you. Like you're saying, Marianne, what I've done in the past is not work. Yeah. Something mm -hmm. needs to break. And so, right. you know, how do you, how do you do this? Okay. What can I do with him? And if I really cannot leave him alone or, you know, he needs to be doing schoolwork completely with me, which I've had children who literally mm -hmm. cannot do the only thing that they did on their own. I bought a map. My kids still laugh. My two dyslexics are the only kids that ever got map workbooks. And the other kid, they're like, mom. And I'm like, did you not figure out until you were like in 10th grade that it was because it was the only thing you could do on your own because it didn't have instructions and I didn't have to read it. Mm -hmm. um, but like a map book or copy work. And my kids do copy work all the way through eighth grade. Um, handwriting or anything like that. And then, or like Jenny said, it's time to walk away from the table until mom's done with her, this. Mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Well, and I think that what, you know, we talk, we're talking history and we're talking, you know, um, it doesn't matter how old your kids are. Ev everybody's going to deal with that tug. You know, if you, even if you have one kid, there's still stuff that's going to come up. There's still things that are going to need your attention and that kid's going to need your attention when you need to work on something else because you're the only other person in the house. Um, so part of this is teaching our kids like you said, Mimi, when it's their turn, when they respect the other person. And that teaching that virtue and teaching that respect is just as important. And the other, other thing I would add is, you know, consider figuring out if there's, if you have two kids that are kind of just so different, see if there is something you can find that you can do with them all together. If that will work, some kids it doesn't work, but because then they're seeing that they're both important at the same time. Even if it's just reading a really fun book aloud that you want to read to them mm -hmm. and they sit and color, sit and play, or they doodle or play Legos or whatever it is, um, something to bring them together so that they can both get your time. It, it like multiplies your attention. So they are getting your attention. They just are both at the same time getting your attention. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a tricky way. And yeah. history and geography are great ways to do that, to read the book, to study the map to do things kind of together and you know there's other subjects that that works for read aloud works the absolute best no matter what science experience. it is um science, science experiments, experiments doing those things together um but that's another way to tackle that and just to look at what um how you can give those kids mm -hmm. attention that they need when you're spread so thin so that is okay, kind of the you. end of our time tonight um any closing thoughts or questions No, oh, awesome. Okay, well, I'm so glad you guys were here. I hope that this was helpful. Um, I know it'll be helpful to those who watch the replay. And I just want to thank you guys for being a part of it. Thank you so much, Mimi, for sharing. We had a couple other mamas who wanted to share and you know how life goes. It just, it's life. So we have to be flexible and do that. But there are lots of great suggestions in the group as well. We were talking history and geography yesterday and today. So those will be there. And tomorrow we'll talk science and math. So thank you for coming.